Our next speaker, and we're going to continue in a theme, is Susanna Timms. She's Dairy Moving Forward and Policy Strategy Manager for Dairy Australia. Susanna has practiced in the field of agriculture policy for over 20 years. Beginning her professional life as a scientist, she then went on to brief four consecutive ag ministers in Victorian government before establishing a consultancy in Canberra in agriculture and food policy. She now manages the policy portfolio at Dairy Australia, working with peak bodies in government on issues ranging from climate, water, animal welfare, emergency disease response, workforce, R&D prioritisation, and the Australian Dairy Sustainability Framework. Welcome, Susanna, presenting the Outlook for Sustainability Policy in Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Both sides of my family are from rural Victoria, and I've worked in agriculture for 30 years, but this is my first gig at the uh, Herd Conference, and it's a delight to be here. My task today is to talk about government policies affecting dairy sustainability. Not a small topic, and so I'm starting broadly with the global policy environment to then context the current Australian sustainability policy relevant to agriculture as I discern it. My objective is to lift your gaze from this room in Bendigo and leave you with a strong sense of dairy's role in the big pressing challenges of our time. And while I'll have a couple of black hatted slides, we should ultimately be optimistic about our industry and its role in our future society. Barry has just articulated a vision for how agriculture can do it. So lift your gaze out of Bendigo, out of Victoria, or indeed out of Australia, to this room in New York. This is where 193 nations came together back in 2015 as the Gen General Assembly for discussion and policy making on the full spectrum of international issues covered by the Charter of the UN. Each year, the General Assembly meets and adopts resolutions and agrees on charting a course for the future. This is where the Sustainable Development Goals were born and adopted by those 193 nations, each with one vote, they agreed in 2015 to pursue these goals within their own nation states and report on progress over 15 years. The Sustainability Development Goals are a call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, improve the lives and prospects of everyone, everywhere. You've all heard of the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them, and Barry also referred to them earlier. The goals are ambitious. In fact, audacious. But the task wasn't cynical at the time. It was optimistic in light of human and planetary plight. And it was intended that nations comprising their governments, industry and private citizens would put in place plans and programs and funding to step towards the 2030 goals. Each nation made a commitment, not, le not legally binding, but ne nevertheless, countries are expected to take ownership and establish within their own jurisdictions a national framework for achieving the 17 goals. In simplistic terms, the role of government here was specifically is to put in place policy and legislative settings that incentivise public and private sectors to be in lockstep with these global goals and as a last resort compel action. We're now at the midway point in that program 2030 is only seven years away. Today, progress is being made in many places, but overall, action to meet the goals is not yet advancing at the speed or scale required. The Midway Summit, again auspiced by the General Assembly of the UN, will consider this process, the progress, in September this year. The outcome of the summit will be a negotiated political declaration. Australia will be there, and what is agreed there, we can expect to come home. Early announcements says that this summit will seek to address the impact of multiple and interlocking crises facing the world since 2015, including the deterioration of key social, economic and environmental indicators. The four Cs are prominent in recent commentary. COVID, high costs, new conflicts and climate change and that the impacts of these have intensified the challenge since 2015. 
The Midway Summit pre-work has resulted in a clear agreement that it will focus first and foremost on people and ways to meet their basic needs. One goal now seems wildly ambitious, ending global hunger. And I chose this goal as an illustration because our industry and agriculture are such a key part of people meeting their basic needs. We have seven harvests, if you think like a grain grower, to realise this ambition. But of course, despite this ambition, zero hunger, the number of people affected by hunger has risen. In 2020, three billion people couldn't afford healthy food, exacerbated by the economic impacts of the pandemic and more recently, Ukraine. An astounding two in three children, two in three children are not fed the minimum diverse diet needed for them to grow and develop to their full potential. Add the climate crisis, the extinction of species, the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, and the UN says in this recent report that world, the world is currently facing the worst food crisis since World War II. To illustrate the point further, the FAO commissioned this infographic showing the proportion of a population who cannot afford a healthy diet. That is, the lowest cost set of foods that would meet requirements for dietary guidelines even if you spent 50% of your income on that food. Zooming into Somalia, one of these countries, and just to prove to you all that my presentation today has not been generated by chat GTP, here is a picture of my husband back in 2017 in Somalia. In 2023, there are 8 million people living in crisis levels of food insecurity here. People are forced to make impossible choices when they're starving, not just skipping meals, marrying off children. They are heavily dependent on external aid, and in particular, grain from Ukraine and Russia. In this particular location where he was standing, 1,000 families share a single tap, a single water tap. The food supply is reliant on cereals, as I said, but also milk. You can see in this landscape how important to a family or group of families the nutrition provided by a single goat or a small herd of sheep, or indeed camels and their milk are a lifeline for many. Healthy herds are helping Somali communities survive. This is a community animal health worker trained by the Red Cross, recognising that in the absence of any vets, there are a whole host of critical animal husbandry skills that need to be gained by and delivered to these communities. And I don't have to point out to you how these communities cannot survive without an industry like yours nor how transformative some very simple interventions can be. Vaccination, basic animal meds, AI, a healthy herd is a lifeline. In fact, in the lead up to the Midway Summit, this is the current homepage of the global dairy platform. This is a partnership of dairy companies, the big global dairy companies, associations, scientific bodies, farmers, and other partners who collaborate pre-competitively to lead and build evidence on dairy's role in the diet and show the sector's commitment to responsible food production. The global dairy platform maps dairy to the sustainability development goals, demonstrating our strong and positive influence on society. Dairy Nourishing Africa is a flagship program leading into the Midway Summit. It's a unique 15 to 20 year public-private partnership where the development of the dairy industry in East Africa will be facilitated. The Global Dairy Platform is providing critical technical dairy capabilities in partnership. And the ambition, of course, is to transform African dairy industries to improve nutrition, enhance livelihoods and stimulate economic growth in a way only dairy can. This initiative uh, advances eight of the sustainability development goals and leverages the global dairy sustainability framework. Dairy is part of the solution. I've pulled out the zero hunger goal as an illustration that dairy is part of the solution. But at the same time, we have 16 other sustainability development goals to heed. They're all interrelated. But these are other especially topical goals for which we are running out of time. The consequences of delaying climate action are on full display. Coral reefs are dying, droughts are protracted, 
extreme events are more prevalent and we've had more than we can say of those in this country over the past two years. In places like Europe, in the European Alps, where I was in December and January, we were in T-shirts on the 1st of January in the heart of the European winter. And in the weeks we had there of bright sunshine, there was no snow. It was warmer there than it was in Melbourne. All the local businesses who had lost their Christmas holiday ski trade were in what they themselves were describing as climate grief and loss. The local communities were in tangible shock, feeling the economic loss as winter trade literally dried up. I'm not showing you this photo from my collection as irrefutable evidence of climate change or indeed of hardship. I'm showing it because of the strong association the locals made with climate change. They are the voting citizens of Europe, in this case France, and this is how a response becomes political. If European climate scientists are saying there will be no more skiing in the Alps by 2050, we can perhaps expect that to motivate political change more than images from Somalia. In the Netherlands, the second biggest exporter of agricultural produce after the US, the nitrogen pollution is so severe it's threatening whole ecosystems. Many of you will have seen articles about this in rural media. The Dutch government proposes to slash farm emissions by 50% by 2030. The percentage will differ by geographic uh, location and on the damage in that particular location and could be up to 70% in some locations. There'll be no other way to do it than to shrink the herd. Unbelievably, the government has issued statements directing farmers to consider whether they continue business and to consider selling up. News outlets have quoted the relevant politicians saying things like, my message is not one farmers want to hear. There's talk of compulsory buyouts to reduce the herd by a third. The common agricultural payment system, which is the subsidies paid to European farmers, will be ramped up in Holland, but Dutch farmers have taken to the streets also in shock at their livelihoods in peril. Farmers with dairy, farm, dairy production in their blood, third, fourth generations on the land, sounds relatable, doesn't it? As such, the relocation or buyout of farmers is almost inevitable, reports the BBC, but forced buyouts are a scenario many hope to avoid. So these are the stories that illustrate the urgency these are the stories that governments are acutely aware of in the lead up to the Midway Summit in September. The Midway Summit has a huge program of work leading into it, involving governments, international organisations, the private sector, civil society, the dairy industry is represented by the International Dairy Federation, and the Global Dairy Platform has a presence at many of these forums too. There are a series of forum summits and meetings with heads of state and governments. The G20 Leaders Summit in Bali, COP27 climate change in Egypt last November, for example, where a day was dedicated to agriculture. The UN Water Conference to be held in New York next month. The Treaty of the High Seas to safe guard and recuperate marine nature was just finalised in Singapore two weeks ago, something Tanya Plibersek gave fanfare to on behalf of Australia. The UN Food Summit, which we heard Bega was recognised there in September 21, that summit underlined the challenge ahead. We're not on track. By 2050, feeding a global population of almost 10 billion will require a radical transformation of how food is produced processed, traded and consumed. Scientists agreed at that summit that we have to change course, that transforming our food systems is among the most powerful way to change course. The Global Food Forum for Food and Ag is the follow-up to that and it's just been held in, in January in Berlin. And one of the key events was the Agriculture Ministers' Conference. 64 Agriculture Ministers, including our own Minister for Agriculture, Senator Murray Watt, came together to discuss food systems transformation. What does that mean, food systems transformation? Well, first, food system is one that delivers food security and nutrition, such that it is profitable, ensuring economic sustainability. It has broad-based benefits for society, securing social sustainability, and that it has a positive or neutral impact on the natural resource environment, safeguarding the sustainability of the environment. Transformation then, given the progress against the SDG ambitions has fallen so far short, 
Transformation means orienting food systems towards healthier diets for all within sustainable planetary boundaries. This is the language we see coming from these forums. The 64 Ag Ministers committed to some key actions. They remained committed to the 2030 goals. That's pretty key. And in particular, that the globe should be united in those goals. Young farmers, women and smallholder farmers should be supported. They are part of the solution. Hunger, energy and climate, extinction of species must be dealt with multilaterally, that is together and cooperatively. And transformation of sustainable food systems should be supported and accelerated. So what does this mean for government policy? What do all these ag ministers take home and act upon within their own economies and their own politics? Well, before we discuss Australia, let's look at a couple of other examples. The EU Green Deal. The EU Green Deal is the biggest reform agenda Europe has embarked on for some time. It aims to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. This is to be embedded into all decision making processes across the EU, a sweeping program of support and reform that touches every sector of the European community. These can be read as policy objectives. This is the yardstick for all new rules and laws. Here are some of the key focus areas. Climate action, sustainable transport, biodiversity, circular economy, which we've heard about earlier. The EU farm to fork strategy is at the heart of the European Green Deal. It sets out Europe's interpretation and version of a transition to a sustainable food system. Its pillars include sustainable production, food waste prevention, sustainable food processing and distribution, and notably, sustainable food consumption. There is an overt objective to evolve diets. Moving to a more plant-based diet is language we see coming out of the European food strategies. With statements like environmentally friendly food to reduce life-threatening diseases and address the environmental impacts of food production. There is much to debate in that statement. But not just domestically, the EU Green Deal sets out to change the way we all operate. And while this posture might raise some eyebrows, their habitual practice of extending their own domestic rules to those who export to them, which they call leadership, while others of us might smell colonialisation, makes the moves of the European Commission highly material to us. And an example of this close to home is the EU domestic ban on the use of some antibiotics in animal agriculture to combat human antimicrobial resistance. A clause in that domestic EU law makes the banned list apply not only to farmers in Europe, but also to all imports. In effect, this means that those medications can't be used in the production of those imports. The extension of their long arm into our farming systems it doesn't matter that our own risk management strategies for protecting antibiotics for serious human illness are actually really good here and contextualised for Australia. The EU ban can impact our trade. This is an example of how government policy elsewhere domestically can step into the Australian farm. Another example we're watching carefully is their carbon border adjustment mechanism. That jargon means that when a product reaches the EU for import, there will be a penalty, a price, based on the carbon footprint, if it is higher than the same good produced in Europe. And in imposing this price, EU producers of that good will not be disadvantaged in their own market, and the EU will have incentivised the importer to lower their emissions. Initially, it will be targeting those goods that are most emissions intensive, cement, iron and steel, aluminium, fertilisers, electricity and hydrogen. But they have flagged in the scope that the new rules will expand over time and agriculture has been mentioned. What they're doing here is multifaceted. One of those facets is that if they are going to realise their climate ambition internally, they need to level the playing field as they push it. The whole Green Deal is a hot negotiation within Europe itself among the 28 member states. Some of those rules being made to apply to imports are the only way they can make progress domestically. 
Turning now to New Zealand, another government we're also watching, where agriculture constitutes more than half of the country's greenhouse gas emissions. New Zealand has legislated a specific target around biogenic methane reduction. Many of you know this. New legislation requires a price to be applied to agricultural emissions. So a government industry Māori partnership was formed to work up a proposal for how this could be done. And New Zealand is now working towards a farm levy based on a split gas approach that is distinguishing between carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide and their relative impacts on global warming. In simple terms, the levy would be reduced as farm businesses reduce those emissions. And the levy would be used for R&D focused on technologies to reduce those emissions. This proposal is subject to some intense industry government debate and discussions and politics over there, as you would have seen at the moment unfolding in the media. But the first thing farmers are required to do is know your number, calculate your baseline. Turning to home, I've set the global context, the multilateral approaches being taken to um, dealing with some of the pressing issues of our time and the manifestation of that in the EU and in New Zealand. Some of you may have read the Treasurer's recent essay in the monthly. It's really very unusual to see a federal politician wax intellectually in a long form written piece and I found it fascinating. The Treasurer speaks of five challenges aligned with the multilateral sustainability agenda that are acutely a shape, shaping policy here in Australia as he sees it. The war in Europe, how China emerges from a zero COVID policy, the potential recessions in the big developed economies in the Northern Hemisphere, when and how rate rises here at home will bite and the uncertain impact of future natural disasters, read climate. It's notable and a sign of the policy agenda to follow that the Treasurer is thinking deeply about what he calls values-based capitalism. His view, that's the only way a government should respond to the big challenges we face here and globally. And whatever your view of this essay, and it did attract a day of Twitterati rousing here in Australia, it can be viewed as his great explainer and a sign of where we would expect ALP policy to turn. He's talking up a national wellbeing agenda by tracking a range of outcomes broader than traditional measures of economic strength. And so we see an employment white paper coming. We see a new sustainable finance architecture emerging that enables investors to understand the climate impacts of investments. He talks about the role for impact investing in aged care, education, disability, and setting up a market framework for that to exist. And this starts to sound like a sustainability agenda. So the ALP policies now in train shouldn't come as a big surprise. The emphasis on public-private investment in the pursuit of sustainable growth, using market mechanisms to deliver social and environmental impacts, like the biodiversity market design being proposed, reinvigorated emphasis on diplomacy and foreign affairs, restoring our reputation in the global sustainability agenda, and in particular, a just and orderly climate transition. The ALP Powering Australia Plan is the policy platform that Australian Labor brought to the last election and is now seeking to implement. At the centre of the plan is a legislated net zero by 2050 target, and a stronger 2030 target to reduce emissions by 43% below 2005 levels. State governments have, compar have comparable targets. The federal government has also signed the Global Methane Pledge, under which participants agree to contribute to a collective effort to reduce global methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Policies targeted at the energy, transport and industry sectors, who collectively represent 79% of Australian emissions, underpin the Powering Australia plan. This is the first place government is turning. Rewiring the nation policy targets the electricity sector. The 15 billion National Reconstruction Fund is intended to finance projects that diversify and transform Australia's industry and economy. and some other policies there too. 
The net zero by 2050 target has bipartisan support, so it's enshrined now in the Climate Act, and it's a policy platform that industry can see as stable and it allows businesses to move on their decarbonisation pathways. You're giving me that with the rush on. <laughs> the next thing coming is Treasury's contemplation on the disclosure of scope three emissions, Barry alluded to this before, and disclosure on climate risks. This will have a bearing on farm businesses and their service sector. Sustainability measurement and reporting will be required. The current debate on the safeguard mechanism might derail things in terms of policy stability. The debate is whether the big emitters should be allowed to buy offsets, unlimited offsets, uh, for their emissions. The no cap on offsets mean that these emitters can continue to emit and not actually have to reduce their real emissions. And the National Farmers Federation is watching this very carefully. Although agriculture is not listed as one of those emitters, the trees and vegetation that would be needed for these unlimited offsets would have to be grown somewhere on private or leasehold land. What does this mean for agriculture? Is it an opportunity and another income stream or does it require so much significant agricultural land that it impinges on food production? This is something the NFF is looking at carefully at the moment. And of course, this shows how closely engaged agriculture needs to be in that debate where there is a, a challenge between balancing a policy for offsets and in fact, supporting food production. 60% of the land mass is managed by agriculturalists, by us. The dairy industry, and this is my last slide. <laughs> the dairy industry here in Australia in 2015 began its own approach telling the world what a positive contribution we make. When it was established, the Australian dairy industry made a promise and four key commitments enhancing economic viability and livelihoods, improving well-being of people, providing the best care for animals and reducing our environmental impact, representing recognised sustainability development goals. And the industry measures and reports on progress annually. The goals are currently set at 2030, but a cyclical review makes the framework a living document and we're constantly keeping check on whether we're pursuing those things that matter most to markets and consumers and the environment. As an example, milk companies currently have to report on their scope one and two emissions. And as we heard uh, earlier, scope three for a milk processor is the dairy farm and Treasury is contemplating whether regulation might be required for reporting there. So for a milk processor, the farm is the scope three emission and for the dairy farmer, the services industry is the scope three emission. Dairy farms at some stage in the future will need to know their baseline and be able to demonstrate they can measure any attested emissions reduction. And this will come sooner than later. The sustainability framework will evolve as this occurs. It faces our markets, and this is the way we can tell markets what we're doing and how we are part of the solution. So the world is slowly coming to realise the significance of the impacts of these big sustainability issues, hunger, climate, conflict. Our ability to develop sustainable, resilient food systems is critical to all aspects of human survival. By extension, relevant to herd improvement industry players, you are about improving the quality of the national herd and for those online, herds elsewhere. Your delivery of improved genetics, AI services, veterinary services, animal disease surveillance and medicines make our animals happier and healthier and more productive and more sustainable and more able to be part of the solution. And I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. This is that. There's a couple of questions come up. I have to advise you, you don't have to take it one on one because we've, um, Suzanne has taken us, we've gone, moved from the Bega Valley and now we've travelled around the world and come back to Australia in a, a very big picture. There's some aspects of it may challenge our thinking, but I think it's really important that these things are presented to us when we look at the sustainability and how this progresses further than just past our own gate or our own businesses or what we do as individuals. So thank you for being able to take us through that journey.